I'm going to make a start now, everyone. Um, thank you for thank you for joining. Welcome to the webinar. Um, the topic is do no harm mitigating human rights risks when interacting with medical institutions and professionals in transplantation medicine. Um, we're going to discuss a world first leading advisory report that's been authored by Wayne George Ash KC, um, and it sets out the international um, legal responsibilities of medical institutions and their professionals to avoid complicity in hidden mass atrocities. Just some housekeeping. Um, if you would, wouldn't mind keeping yourselves on mute um, and we're going to record the session, but we won't record the Q&A, so don't worry, none of the audience will be recorded. Um, if you have a question, please could you pop it in the chat? Um, and I'll make sure I get to it a little bit later on after, after the panellists have all spoken. Um, we have a fantastic panel today. Everyone has interesting things to say. Um, time is tight, so I'm going to keep an eye on the time. Um, I'll briefly introduce the panel. I know everyone's probably read their bios already. So we have Wayne Jordash Casey. He's a well-renowned international human rights and humanitarian law lawyer. He has an exceptional practice and we're extremely grateful um, for all the work that he's done with us um, at ETAC. We then also have Professor Natalia Schlebowska. She's the chair of the Australian Lawyers, Human Rights, Business and Human Rights Subcommittee. She's a professor in law um, and she's an expert on modern slavery. Welcome, Natalia. We also have Professor Penelope Weller. She's a professor in law as well at RMIT University. She's an expert in health law and mental health law, and she's published extensively on the subject. And then we're very lucky to have Dr. Maria Jovanovic as well. Um, she's a lecturer at Essex Law School and Human Rights Centre and has a focus on human trafficking and modern slavery, especially in the context of international business trade and global value chains. So thank you all for joining us. Um, it's very much appreciated. Thank you for taking the time. So without further ado, I pass over to Wayne to tell us more about the advisory. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, thank you, Ellie. And thank you everyone for attending to uh, listen to um, our um, uh, commentary about the legal advisory and policy guidance. I'm really hoping that we can have a, a a real discussion amongst the, the experts uh, today on these issues. Uh, I think there's uh, lots to be learned from those who are part of this panel. Let me also firstly say, um, whilst I appreciate Ellie saying the report was done by me, I want to note that uh, Lara Strangeways, who's the head of our business and human rights, and May Prantle, who is one of our advisors, were really critical to the um, work uh, within the advisory and the policy guidance um, their, their thumbprints are on every page and so um, I wouldn't want to take credit for their work. Um, let me now turn quickly to the legal advisory and the policy guidance and what we were trying to achieve uh, with these uh, documents. First of all we started looking at these issues uh, because um, it became apparent to us from open source research that um, in a number of countries, medical institutions, hospitals, uh, essentially across the whole transplant uh, industry, um, there were many partnerships and much activity being done without any um, apparent cognizance of uh, the human rights risks um, and as a consequence of that um, or at least in part as a consequence of that without any due diligence being conducted uh, which could um, in any way uh, meet the challenges of these human rights risks and so we started to uh, look at this open source research and then embarked on a six-month uh, deeper dive into the transplant industry to have a look at what uh, the human rights risks were within uh, the transplant industry and critically what was being done about them within the industry, if anything, and um, what should be done uh, in, in light of uh, the um, what we found to be obvious risks. And so the advisory 
was an attempt or is an attempt to raise public awareness um, within the industry, but beyond the industry as well, amongst such uh, policy makers, parliamentarians, think tanks, international organizations, and of course, um, critically amongst international lawyers and lawyers as a, as, as a whole, uh, to raise awareness essentially of um, what are real systemic problems within the industry um, and, and, and the, the, the uh, gargantuan amount of work that needs to be done to meet the risks that exist um, in terms of both um, soft law and hard law. And I'll come to that in a minute. And we deal with that extensively in the advisory. And we also deal with it in, in the policy guidance. Uh, as you will see from both documents, the advisory is much more of a dis discussion document outlining risks, outlining um, uh, what the um, uh, state of play is within the industry, but also um, how those risks can be ameliorated. And the um, policy is much more about concrete steps uh, that uh, different parts of the uh, transplant industry could and should take in order to meet uh, these challenges. So just very quickly, what are the human rights risks in transplantation medicine that we deal with in the advisory? Well, we elaborate in detail uh, about essentially a sliding scale of risks. Um, on the one hand, what we referred to and what is referred to as transplant tourism, which is a, at the softer end of the risk. Um, but uh, when I say softer, I, I'm not trying to diminish those, those risks, nor um, the human rights violations which occur um, as a consequence of transplant tourism. It's a big industry. It accounts for 10% of the world's transplants um, and is a lucrative industry uh, with annual revenue between 850 million US dollars to 1.7 billion US dollars. Um, what is transplant tourism? Well, it's essentially um, part of the industry which um, essentially uh, involves the exchange of um, organs for money. Um, and according to the World Health Organization, it essentially um, undermines uh, the key principles of ethical organ donation and transplantation, namely voluntary and informed consent. For the World Health Organization, um, it's uh, uh, organ uh, transplantation of this kind um, lacks the kind of willingness and free um, uh, exchange uh, of um, organs or free, free uh, giving of organs, um, essentially because it, it um, uh, consists of uh, exchanges which involve undue influence um, and or coercion. So that's the, if you like, the softest uh, end of the human rights risk scale. And you travel through organized um, crime uh, of, of organ trafficking, which you might consider to be in the middle, and then the top scale, which um, consists of uh, state-sanctioned regimes uh, where organs are forcibly removed from executed prisoners and prisoners of conscience, as in the People's Republic of China. So the advisory looks at this scale and asks certain criti critical questions about what the industry is doing uh, to um, uh, confront these risks. We do have a focus in on China because it's worthwhile um, and it's also quite instructive. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, the organ uh, system or organ transplantation system in China, um, it's worthwhile having a dive into the advisory. Um, there are strong indications uh, that um, there is a state sanctioned regime of forced organ harvesting. Uh, beginning around the early 2000s, when China leapt from being a follower to a leader of transplantation technology, despite there being no voluntary donation system. Within a few years, the country made impressive developments in the field of transplantation, and these developments have continued, uh, moving from uh, surgery, which focused on uh, only kidney transplants, to now hearts, lungs, and, and, kid uh, and, and livers. 
And more, moreover, these strong indications include um, transplants being able to be planned well in advance with specific dates on organ availability um, able to be communicated to the intended recipient well ahead of time. Obviously, these are serious red flags. Um, in 2009, China stated that two thirds of all organs used in transplantations were removed from death row prisoners, but asserted that prisoners had consented. Um, also, um, that uh, admission uh, did not appear to lead to any change in terms of the uh, practices, in terms of the red flags. Um, it also um, continued uh, to correspond to a crackdown on Falun Gong. Um, the, uh, for those of you that are not familiar, familiar with Falun Gong, it's a spiritual practice rooted in traditional Buddhist and Daoist teaching. And um, they've been subjected um, to a system of, um, well, a campaign, I would say, of uh, crimes against humanity, which involved disappearances, extrajudicial killings, and other grave human rights violations since around 1999. And the progress of the Chinese transplant system has corresponded uh, quite disturbingly with that crackdown. Um, probably you've heard of the China Tribunal. This may constitute one of the uh, best indicators or, or uh, certainly the most extensive adjudicative process into these issues and they found um, that essentially uh, there was proof of a campaign of crimes against humanity established beyond reasonable doubt and part of that or a large uh, focus of that was the uh, forced organ harvesting from Falun Gong. I won't go into much more detail of that, but it is important to look at these, these issues and we do so in depth in the advisory because in, in a sense, there's such a clear indication from this evidence and it's important as a departure point then to look at what's the response of the transplant industry to these clear indications um, of um, serious uh, gross human rights violations being connected to the transplant industry, at least in China. Well, the, 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 the answer to that is, is not terribly edifying. Um, if you look across the industry, there is a general compl complacence at best. At worst, actually, there's a closing of the eyes to the obvious. Um, for example, international transplantation societies such as the Global Transplantation Society regularly interact with Chinese transplantation professionals as part of academic conferences, professional development programs, and so on, um, without any uh, indication of due diligence. Pharmaceutical companies enter into joint ventures with Chinese companies to carry out research and trials into new immunosuppressive drugs and are granted exclusive distribution licenses in China, again, without any indication of uh, due diligence. Um, and I could go on, several studies carried out by bioethicists and other researchers have shown that well-known medical journals have published numerous research articles by Chinese medical professionals where it could not be ascertained that the donor had consented to having their organs removed or used for research purposes. And so this is what we discuss at length in the advisory. We touch upon the type of um, links that could give rise to legal um, uh, um, consequences. And we touch, of course, on uh, the uh, um, wider issues of um, partnerships and activities being uh, linked uh, in a more remote way to these types of human rights violations. And so um, what we also try to do in the advisory is, is to set up or describe how uh, the transplant industry should be um, confronting these risks. We looked at so the soft law framework of the UN guiding principles, of course, and we also looked at hard law requirements under various domestic laws in Australia, New Zealand, the US, Canada, France, Belgium, the UK, and also on a broader European and e EU level. Now we discussed some of some of these um, uh, this this growing web of um, of regulation and laws. Um, 
we of course were focused much more on the dimension of cross-border relationships in organ transplantation we we of course couldn't look at, at everything not there's a, a, a vast uh, array of protocols and regulations in, in each of the countries that we looked at. Um, but we've, as I say, narrowed in on the focus um, of uh, cross-border relationships and looked at, of course, um, what under the UN guiding principles should be done by institutions, individuals, and the industry as a whole. Human rights policy statements, of course, how to develop, implement, and evaluate uh, minimum human rights due diligence and remedies and remediation. And we hope that uh, the policy guidance, as I touched on at the beginning, uh, is a good tool, at least a departure point tool, um, so that those within the industry who are not familiar with um, this soft law or hard law can start to think seriously about their responsibilities and take action uh, accordingly. Just very quickly before I stop, uh, there's been a number of developments since publication of the advisory and the policy guidance. Um, you will probably be aware of the EU Parliament at the beginning of May of this year adopting a resolution on the continued reports of forced organ harvesting in China, in which it acknowledged that forced organ harvesting in China may amount to crimes against humanity and called on relevant institutions in member states to evaluate and revisit the terms of their collaborations with Chinese institutions on transplant medicine research and training. The UK has passed the Health and Care Act um, recently, which amends the Human Tissue Act 2004 and adds extraterritorial offences under Section 32A for commercial dealings in organs carried out in China or other countries. Um, there is, and I won't um, belabor the point, I hope we can discuss it um, in the next 40 minutes or so, uh, but there is a growing um, awareness, at least on the national level, even if not within the industry, uh, that this, uh, these practices need to be better regulated. And what we hope, as I say, to do in the advisory and the uh, policy guidance is to try to drive that change within the industry. Um, there is movement, but there needs to be much more uh, movement. So let me, let me pause there. Um, and open the discussion up for other panelists. Thank you for the time. Okay, thank you so much, Wayne. That was brilliant and clear. Um, yes, we'd very much like to hear from the other panelists. So perhaps um, I think if, if Natalia, Professor Natalia uh, Slabowska, would you like to make some comments first? Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellie, and thank you, Wayne. Um, that was really, really excellent. Um, as Ellie has already said, um, I'm, I'm speaking predominantly today on behalf of Australian Lawyers for Human Rights, which is a um, non-governmental human rights organization in Australia, one of the biggest ones that comprises um, legal professionals, uh, law academics, and law students in, um, in graduates. But before I move any further, I just would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to elders past, present, and, and emerging and honor the cultures and histories of Australian indigenous um, peoples um, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which many of us today participate in today's event um, uh, are based, which for, for those of you, um, uh, of, of the participants that might not be familiar, that is a protocol used in Australia to pay respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in, 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 in Australia. Now, um, the, uh, very briefly, uh, because I think it, it's important to put it into context in terms of um, how how transplantations, how um, especially illegal uh, potential for illegal trans transplantation, organ transplantation might come about in, in the context of modern slavery. So we have been involved in the development of modern slavery legislation in Australia and just um, a quick side point for those who might be less familiar, Australia has currently two acts, Modern Slavery Act um, 2018 uh, at the Commonwealth level, but also in the state of New South Wales. Um, so at the, at the state level. And since the inception of this development, we've been involved with other organizations, including um, ETAC, on uh, advocating for the inclusion of organ, tra organ trafficking and in particular the illicit removal of organs um, from living or deceased persons um, and the solicitation of commercial organ transplants in the modern slavery legislation. To some extent, it has been um, successful. 
uh, in a sense that the Modern Slavery Act in New South Wales makes a reference to Section 32 of the Human Tissue Act 1983, which prohibits uh, trading in uh, tissue. Now, with this example, I just wanted to um, highlight the difficulties in relation to uh, legislating um, matters, uh, uh, matters in, in the context of organ, organ trafficking, not so much uh, within the national jurisdiction, but when it comes to uh, trans, transnational issues. And so just very briefly, uh, and I'm happy then um, during our conversation to touch on it in much more detail, provide a bit more context uh, in Australia. But what I think is important here is that during the public consultation, a number of reservations have been made in relation to even including that reference, uh, including by the government, the New, you know, New South Wales government. And the, the basis of it was that New, uh, New South Wales um, health um, imports um, blood-related uh, products, particularly plasma-derived products from different parts of the world in different countries that do allow uh, for donors to be paid for the donations, which potentially would be in breach of Section 32, and consequently um, what you will find in Modern Slavery Act in New South Wales at the moment is reference to Section 32 that is prohibiting trading in tissue, however, only when that tissue is an organ. So I think it highlights the, the, the difficulties that weigh also touched on, which is that even when we have national legislation um, that it's attempting to deal with um, organ trafficking, and again, that, that is also contextual in the sense that um, what is reg regulated within uh, Australia, so anyone, a donor bring, being brought in or moved into Australia, that would be considered to be trafficking offence. However, for Australians to travel overseas, I uh, would I mention uh, the uh, tr uh, transplant tourism uh, to purchase an organ that would not be criminalized by, by itself. So even when we have um, laws, national laws in place, they might not necessarily be compatible with laws elsewhere. And so that's why it's so important and advisory really um, highlights that issue of global co collaboration, cooperation in this space, in the sense that um, legislating at the national level is very important, but we still need that international global engagement in the subject matter, because otherwise we're always going to find that there are going to be gaps and um, the gaps will be will be um, used and those gaps will be um, exploited. Now, I'm pretty sure that we are going to touch on much more on um, in the, how that can be regulated in the context of business and human rights, but I will leave it to other speakers to touch on it and then I'm pretty sure we're going to um, um, have a more in-depth conversation about it uh, altogether. So I'll pass it on to Maria now. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. I will just briefly introduce myself and say a couple of words reflecting on the legal advisory report and policy guidance. And I'm just happy to answer later on any questions that you might have. So uh, my name is Maria. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Essex Law School and Human Rights Center. Um, one of the world's oldest academic and human rights centers. I have to mention we are celebrating the 40th anniversary this month. Uh, my own research focuses on modern slavery and human trafficking, and it looks at the way this phenomenon intersects with different legal regimes. So the advisory and policy guidance uh, address important issues and raise critical questions that require attention, in my view, by international community and individual stakeholders. They illustrate uh, pretty well a growing demand for organs, which has unfortunately resulted in a series of unethical and in many cases, illegal practices. So the documents then explore, as Wayne said, the legal ramifications of relationships with medical institutions and professionals who may engage in such unethical organ transplantation, organ trafficking, or even forced organ harvesting. So my understanding was that the key goal of both the report and policy guidance is to explain how the existing legal rules apply to such practices and more specifically implications for the private sector here. So in other words, the goal was to flesh out rules of international and domestic laws that apply to those that engage in such practices. And I believe also to identify gaps in the current regulation uh, and or in the implementation of the existing rules. 
So I think what's really important is when mm, they, the report and uh, policy guidance speak about, uh, for instance, uh, phenomena such as forced organ harvesting, which amounts to crimes against humanity, given the audience it primarily targets, I think it's very important to unpack these terms and make them palatable to non-legal professionals. Um, what do they mean for a specific company, organization, and individual? And, and they, I think, successfully do that. Um, I just have to say uh, that, as we saw here, much of these documents are written with a specific country in mind. But in my view, I think it's crucial to shape the regulatory framework in a way to, able, to be able to tackle any such practice anywhere in the world. What we really need is universal framework that governs the field. And I would say there is some evidence of such emerging framework, but I would say that the regulation of this space is really in its infancy, which allows for abuses. So I just wanted briefly to look at, for instance, four practices that these documents I'd address, uh, on a, which go on a scale of severity, I would say. So the first would be violations of the principle of consent after donor death. The second one is voluntary sale of organs, of course, under economic duress. And then we have organ trafficking and trafficking persons for the purpose of organ removal, which is quite important to distinguish, but we are not gonna go into that in more detail in law. Um, and finally, forced organ harvesting that in, um, amounts to crimes against humanity. So what's really, I think, critical here is with regards to each of these practices to answer which laws govern them, who do such laws address, how are they enforced, and what are the risks for private sector who are not directly involved in such practices but benefit from them. So I've created or initially quite a complex table to illustrate the comp uh, complexity and confusion within the legal landscape, but I'm not gonna show it here because of the time pressure. I just wanted to focus on few themes. So when we speak about these practices, we need to consider what is their legal manifestation? What is their legal definition? How do we know what's prohibited? Because to tackle something, to address, to put obligation on corporations to do something, they really need to know what is legal and what is illegal and what is the gray zone. So we need to look at legal definitions and they are lacking currently. And then we need to move on to look at the source of law. And why is that important? It's important because where do we find the rules that regulate certain practices? These rules will likely determine who is a duty bearer and how do we enforce these duties that are enforced? So the report and the policy guidance highlight certain areas of human rights law, international criminal law. So it's really important to explain to non-lawyers for instance, the fact that human rights law is not, it's only indirectly addressing private sector. And there is some emerging uh, uh, field of business and human rights, but it's really important to highlight, I would cite here, the commentary to the UN guiding principles, which makes clear that legal obligations are found elsewhere, not in the guiding principles. So I quote uh, at four, four, uh, 14, the commentary that was published on 21st March 2011, that the responsibility of business enterprises to respect human rights is distinct from issues of legal liability and enforcement, which remind, remain defined largely by national law provisions. So uh, this is important to acknowledge if we want to see how do we then make, uh, you know, reg regulate this space, what is needed to put in place in order to prevent those practices. And then the report speaks at length, as Ewain mentioned, about domestic criminal laws. But again, these apply, unlike human rights law, directly to individuals and legal persons. But it's a quite high threshold of liability. Um, and distant relationship might not uh, pass the muster. And when you call, talk about international criminal law, again, I think it's really important to outline what is the potential liability for corporations for crimes against humanity? And it's, it's the, at the moment, I think this discussion is largely academic. Uh, and I'm not sure even, and that brings me to my last point, that we should be focusing so much on criminalization. Um, I think what is missing is regulation, regulate, regulating the sector. And there is a good example, for instance, of the Council of Europe Convention on Organ Trafficking, but we only have 13 ratifications so far. 
So there is a clear uh, and pressing need for regulation that governs the field, sets clear standards and expectations and protocols that need to be followed. And in that way, it would capture both those, um, I don't know how Wayne said, softer risks, and those more extreme that the focus, uh, that the reports and, and policy guidance mainly focus on. And with that, I would finish. I just wanted to um, say that I would invite people when reading documents like this to just think of uh, the, uh, four divisions between ethical versus legal responsibility, between soft and hard law. Uh, what is it a guidance? Is it a firm obligation to think between the law as it is now and the law we would like to see, but it's not yet there, we need to acknowledge that. And to think of the distinction between criminalization and regulation. So thank you so much for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, I'm sure that's gonna spark lots of debate. Penelope, would you like to, to say some words now? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Ellie, and, and thanks um, both to Natalia and, and Maria. I can I just begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land around Australia uh, and pay my respects with the elders past, present and emerging. In my particular case, I pay my respects to the Palawa people of Luchawita, uh, which some of you may know as Tasmania. Um, I think it's really important for us to discuss, uh, to have this kind of forensic analysis of the law. Will the law in each of our nations do the job that we want it to do? This is an ongoing debate in human rights law. As Natalia pointed out, uh, Australia does have a Modern Slavery Act. We do outlaw trafficking in organs, but there are some gaps and limitations in the way we do it. And there's questions about whether the penalties attached to that framework would be sufficient to deter people from doing some of the actions that we think uh, would uh, have been highlighted in the advisory. Uh, just for the international audience, of course, uh, Australians must remind you all that we do not have uh, recognition of human rights at the federal level, uh, which does uh, in impact the way in which our law is interpreted uh, in this nation, saying that several states do have human rights legislation, but it's certainly not uniform. But because of the difficulties in the legal framework, uh, I would say that, that it is absolutely more important that we turn to the United Nations Principles for Business and Human Rights and turn to the framework of human rights due diligence to encourage parties and individual stakeholders to look towards the issues that are raised in this advisory. In a place like Australia where we have uh, uh, highly regulated uh, lawful organ transplants, some people will be very surprised to even hear about the international trade. So it's very important to, to raise that. Um, but I think that this is uh, well, our experience with the Modern Slavery Act, which is relatively new, uh, as uh, Natalia said, but uh, it is mirrored in the UK, that while companies might, companies and institutions might engage in human rights due diligence reporting, they often have a limited or narrow idea of what might be the, the required content of those reports. So it is really important to raise this kind of awareness about the, the human rights issues that may impact on players uh, in, in the transplant industry. I think that the, the, the Global Rights Advisory is a real call out for universities and academy. Uh, academy has not been engaging in the kind of human rights diligence that we may need. We are the educators of doctors, of allied health professionals, nurses, radiographers, all kinds of people. We are the educators of international students in Australia. We are the educators of the Asia Pacific region to a large extent. So we can play a huge role in understanding the human rights at stake in the industry and working out and thinking through what would be the kind of requirements that we would want to see in human rights due diligence reporting from the academic sector. Of course, um, the, the uh, uh, universities are in, in a wonderful position to have lots of human rights experts within their ranks who could assist them with working out what that framework uh, should look like. For human rights due diligence and our difficulty in Australia is I don't think there is a deep understanding of many of the content of human rights uh, laws and what they mean in practice on the ground, particularly in health and human rights kind of frameworks. And that um, what we really need to encourage is a deeper engagement with the principles of human rights so that we can understand human rights due diligence in its full sense, uh, 
uh, it is a far, far more deeper engagement that would be required by due diligence in a commercial law sense. And so we need to uh, encourage that uh, throughout Australia. Uh, here in the advisory, we have a huge amount of evidence to allow us to start that debate and really encourage the human rights engagement uh, that we need. So thanks very much, Ellie. Thank you so much, Penelope, and to everyone. Um, lots has just been said. Um, just for me, it's really great that you you will broadly support the advisory and you've all got lots of ideas about how to take it forward and that's exactly what we wanted to achieve um, in commissioning it. Um, we're doing okay for time so perhaps the panellists if you'd like to answer each other's points because I, I could see that there are lots of nods and perhaps people jotting things down so does anyone want to say anything in relation to someone else's comments? I, I, I'll, I'll say, sorry, go on, uh, Natalia, I can see you going, you go first. No, 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 you go first. I, I think it's, it's only right that, that way you go first, actually, in response to our uh, brief commentaries. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I think one point I'd just like to address is, I think one, one of the themes which seemed to run through um, the panellists was the idea that we should not um, just be overly focused on the criminal, and I, I completely agree with that. And I. Um, hope that the advisory and the policy, I mean, what we were trying to achieve with them was to, of course, um, in, in one sense, to, to, to highlight the, the biggest dangers, um, which ought to be and require criminal enforcement. Um, on the other hand, I think we, uh, the, the authors, were certainly of the view that um, as Penelope put it, deep, what we needed to encourage was deeper engagement with um, human rights as a, as a whole um, within the industry. Uh, of course, through the UN guiding principles. I mean, what was um, striking to us as we conducted the research was um, the, and I use the word complacency, but I think that's rather a kind uh, description of what we found within the industry. Um, there, there, there was, there isn't a culture of engagement with human rights um, more generally. There is a sense that within the industry we found that um, because we're the medical, because we're saving lives, because um, uh, we we are looking after people, then these human rights risks are something to do with somebody else. And so there, there isn't there isn't within the industry any attempt to understand the UN guiding principles, or even putting them aside, or any attempt to really conduct any um, uh, minimal um, inquiry into um, relationships or activities. So I, I I think we 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 all came to the view that you know this this was going to be an essential part of. Um, uh, increasing awareness and also better practice was to try to um, explain in layperson's terms uh, what steps the industry should be taking to regulate the, themselves. And, and you know, I, I was genuinely shocked. I think we all were genuinely shocked how complacent the industry is. So I think the UN guiding principles has to be at the forefront of this um, of this of this struggle. I think. Thanks, Wayne. Um, anybody else? If I can, but sorry, Barry, I do want to go first. <clears throat> okay, right. Um, yeah, yeah, just very, just very briefly on on that point because I, again, from practice, from practical point of view, I see the advisory being a very important very practical tool to the industry. And first of all, raising awareness because working in the field for, for many years and also working on the advisory um, group to the, uh, on modern slavery to the New Zealand government, I can attest that actually the understanding of um, this, this issue or, or, or you know, um, abuses, illegal organ transplantation, organ tourism, et cetera, is almost unknown, even, th um, even by the uh, legislator. We, you would kind of expect this to be a little bit, um, but, you know, um, um, but they understood the topic, which is not. So it's definitely that, 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 if anything, that's a first starting point. And I think that advisory does that excellent in the sense that it really raises the issue and it puts it in very pra 
practical, if not pragmatic uh, matters as to what can be done and how can be done looking for the red flags and then what, you know, what, what the industry can do to address those issues on daily basis. Now, very briefly on something that has been raised on a number of occasions, yeah, so criminalizing um, uh, generally anything in relation to human trafficking, it, it's always a little bit problematic. Um, and um, and, and especially when we when we're talking about the context of business, uh, businesses because businesses tend to um, respond better where, with co collaboration partnerships rather than you know taking out the stick and saying because you're going to be li uh, legally liable properly. Uh, potentially also criminally but even what i said earlier in terms of the regulation of organ organ transportation in australia i do believe that even though we have strong laws they are currently um, inadequate to protect um trafficking in human organs both domestically and internationally having said that there are limitations of a criminal response to um organ trafficking for very simple reason because there is a global crisis global organ crisis and there are basically organ shortages. So that there is, it's a question of supply and demand. So by simply saying we, we have to criminalize or we need more laws in place, it's not gonna solve the problem really on the ground. So it, it's about those different approaches and looking how we can shift a, the understanding to raise the understanding and the shift the um, how businesses, how any entities, because that would apply also to public entities, how they identify what the potential risk might be in, in this context, what the tissue cells or organs they're using or relying on. So I think it's definitely, um, it, it's a multi-layered um, and, and um, approach to it. And criminalizing is one aspect of it, but definitely should not be the only aspect. And so therefore, whether we're going through the law or law supports, the um, uh, understanding and implementation of principles, uh, guiding principles, human guiding principles on business in, in human rights, they, they go hand in hand rather than one or the other. Uh, and, and I think that that's really what's been happening in the field uh, in relation to other aspects with other forms of modern slavery as well. But I'll leave it there and, and uh, I believe Maria wanted to um, respond. Hi, thank you. I actually just wanted to respond to um now what you have also said so i agree with wayne when he says there and i mean i don't know that but i trust because the report illustrates that there is a huge complacency now whether it is for industry to regulate itself i have no faith in it um so uh, when i said more laws i don't say more criminal laws uh, laws that regulate practices. So, um, and I think organ transplantation is not very um, unique here. Generally, there is lack of regulation in other um, aspects of medical industry. So, for instance, recently I came across something interesting about IVF. That is, for instance, hugely unregulated, and there are huge ethical issues around there. Um, there are practices where doctors and clinics um, use their own sperm to inseminate clients. There are practices where doctors put 12 embryos in a woman, even though the guidelines, the professional guidelines say not more than, and it's not regulated when they are called out, when they are eventually put on trial. Um, and that again is criminal law, there is nothing really much illegal going on there. So I think regulation means setting clear expectations. And just to answer to the question from the audience of um, distinguished professor Richard Piotrovich, whom I recognize here, uh, I think this would not maybe change policies that China does, but it will isolate them. If the rest of the world subscribes to the same set of guidance and principles, which are made law, um they will not their hands will be bound they will not be able to engage because they will be liable potentially for breaching those protocols um maybe financially not criminally i don't know what's the best uh, way of doing it but i think it will definitely isolate what i think when i read this i was looking what governs this space and i think very little rules clear rules govern this space uh, so that was my point. I definitely am not calling for more criminalization. Thank you. I, let, let, let me just say well, at one point, if I can, that it, it just just um, having said what I said about the UN guiding principles, I think there is growing evidence within the uh, field that criminal law um, 
can and and does and does work um, in this as um, uh, Maria's just said this unregulated space. If you look, for example, at um, the Philippines and um, Israel, um, previously um, the Philippines was a place where um, many Westerners or uh, went to purchase organs and the Philippines passed uh, criminal law provisions that prohibited organ donations to foreigners. Um, and on the other side, um, Israel uh, used to be a country where many citizens went from Israel to, for example, the Philippines um, to buy organs. And in 2008, they decriminalized uh, the traveling of um, individuals to um, other countries to procure organs and as a consequence you can see after a few years there's been a, a very much a drop in um, uh, the uh, number of um, organs being sold in the Philippines and a, 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 a dramatic fall in uh, transplant tourism as a whole in that in that country and of course in in Israel I think you, you also see a corresponding um, huge fall in the uh, number of individuals traveling to procure organs so I think because it is so unregulated there's still a lot of space for criminal law to to play their part I think um, in 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 regulating this industry okay go Penelope feel free uh Thank you, and I, and I think it, I think that's a really interesting discussion about the role of criminal law, and and we do need uh, laws that address the problems that we're going to address, and we need to do the research that says what are the effects of this law when you implement it this way. So okay, so we know how to stop uh, transplant tourism. That's the way to do that. Uh, we need to think how we stop the other forms and the complicity with the illegal activity. We need to be much more astute and careful about our analysis of the law and what we do with it. And we do have to um, have a national analysis of that detail in every instance. I'm sorry, Maria, IVF is highly regulated in Australia. So, uh, you know, everybody's laws are different. It is one of the challenges of being, of being a, a legal academic that you have to deal across all sorts of uh, jurisdictions. But we need to put the uh, expertise in place so we know what laws work in what instances and what effect they will have. We must pay attention to implementation of laws. We must pay attention to interpretation of laws. But this is the expertise that uh, we can bring to the field. Thank you, Penelope. Um, I think we'll open it to the floor now because time's tight. Um, so I have um, from Rick, or oh, RYP law professor, too many prosecutors and judges are unaware of the NP principle or how it should be applied, but the UK lost a big case on this in Strasbourg about 18 months ago. Does anyone want to comment on that? Did we hear from the, um, the question? <laughs> I'm not aware of the Strasbourg case. Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, Natalia. Yeah. Again, no, 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 no. I want to answer, but I think it's a good. Uh, it's, I think it's a good idea, Richard. If you wouldn't mind. Okay, I'll just try to unmute. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, we can. The, the, I made the strategy in response to the the point put by KF. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, KF. I'm looking for your name. I, I do apologise. Uh, it's a bit early in the day for me. I haven't had a drink yet. The, the, the point is that uh, when the non-punishment principle came up and, and I, I was, I've been working on this for longer than I care to remember. The point I was making is that the, it is a real, still a major problem in some countries, in some jurisdictions, and I can't speak for Australia. I've been away from Australia for too long, but it's a big issue still in Europe. There's much more awareness in the United Kingdom of it now. The case I was referring to there was one brought against the UK for the first time in about 2011, it shows you how fast Strasbourg works. It's, it's almost as slow as the International Court of Justice. And it only got decided in about, I think it was the spring of last year. And 
the UK was found to be in breach of Article 4 of the European Convention of Human Rights, i.e. prohibition on slavery, forced labour and servitude, and therefore trafficking, because of its failure to apply the non-punishment principle to, uh, I think there were three different cases, three different people who had been uh, penalised, although they had been trafficked and should not have been penalised because their offences were directly linked to the fact that they had been trafficked. So that was the whole point about it. And I'm not sure how that is, how much that fits in with what you have been discussing here this evening or this morning, uh, but it was a, a response to the previous comment from, from, from Kanish Latiman. I apologize if, if I have mispronounced that. Uh, so, but that's what I was getting at. Yeah, um, uh, is it okay, Ali, if, if I... Um, of course, of course. Provide, um, Thank a, you, yeah. A response to it, yeah. Um, oh. So the the issue of... Um, the issue really here is that most legal instruments in this space, they don't really make a clear distinction between organ sellers and organ suppliers. And as I said, in some countries, it is illegal to sell um, organs, even if they are on, your own. And But if you look into the actual uh, prosecution um, statistics, the, the, it, from my understanding, not many actually people who sell or attempt to sell their own organs are, are prosecuted for it. So even though the law exists, it might not necessarily be um, enforced in those um, in those uh, instances. Um, so if, if we're talking about them being victims, but I suspect um, it could be a question of recipients, um, because how, who is actually in this case a um, victim here, right? Is the recipient in a sense a victim of the global crisis and they, let's say they do uh, travel overseas to, to, um, to um, purchase an organ, which as I said, under Australian law, that would not be considered to be an offense of organ trafficking because under the definition, no one has been moved to from or within Australia. Uh, some countries have attempted, um, Canada including, have attempted to criminalize uh, those who would travel to purchase organs, whether legally or illegally, uh, um, outside of, of, of their own um, uh, jurisdiction. So we're talking about the introduction of extraterritorial jurisdictional uh, criminalization. Now, whether that's fair approach, obviously, from a moral point of view, we might we might say it's probably not. Is it something that is going to prevent people from traveling? Um, probably not. Uh, not necessarily so. But there's another issue that we we touched on the, the, the global um, shortage or the, the matter of supply and demand in this case. But also there is a divide um, between uh, those with high so recipients are usually those from high income countries and, and donors or suppliers are usually from low income countries. So obviously the issue is not and only simply about um, regulating on organ, uh, organ transplantation industry as such, but a, a much wider systemic issue of um, poverty and that pushes people to sell their own organs. Uh, or there'd be many cases in, in, on, in relation to, um, for example, migrant smuggling, where in order for them to move to, let's say, to Europe, they, on the, road, on the route, they had to sell um, their organs in order to pay the smugglers to continue on the road. So obviously, there's a much more complex than just simply saying the, the industry needs to regulate itself. Obviously, we do need to um, change the culture of how industry as Wayne has said, has not regulated itself, and therefore, uh, what can be done to ensure that the industry regulate uh, is become better regulated, whether self-regulated or through uh, mandatory approaches. But also, we cannot forget that th this is a past a part of a much bigger problem, which is obviously in relation to um, the root causes that is the organ shortages, and also it is um, according and along the lines of poverty, uh, the poverty line. So obviously, this definitely is beyond um, uh, what the advisory could have done, and this is beyond a potential conversation today, but I, I think it's important to highlight it, that um, the, the inequalities um, in, in, in terms of um, wealth also uh, drives the practice of who becomes a seller, who becomes a donor, who becomes a recipient, uh, whether that's with, with a national level or, or internationally. 
So it's a little bit longish response to Richard's uh, question, but I think the, the, the identification who is actually a victim and, and non-punishment of victims, it potentially could be even more um, complex depending on how we identify who is a victim within, within this context. Yeah, and, and may I just add to, to, to what you've just said, which um, the, the, the exact statistics, um, uh, I, I forget, but we're talking about the average um, purchaser having um, an, in, an average income of around $50,000 a year and the average donor um, having one of about $500 per year. So the, the inequality is absolutely massive. And the, and the donors are not just poor, they are the poorest. So I think it's it's really an important departure point to think when thinking about these issues. Thanks so much. Um, we've got a hand up from Kanej Fatima. Um, please, if you can un unmute yourself, um, feel free to ask a question or comment. Thank you. Hey, hello everyone. Um, so um, I actually I'm doing research on human trafficking, and um, recently I finished uh, fieldwork on organ trafficking, basically in Bangladesh. So that's why I asked that question because I found um, there is still confusion about the definition of uh, trafficking of human beings for organ removal and organ trafficking, and also confusion about illegal organ transplant. So, um, and also like uh, I found gaps in international law because trafficking protocol is not enough to uh, define organ trafficking. On the other hand, uh, we can see European convention, but that is not open for the third world countries who are the most, uh, who are mostly source countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, and other Southeast um, Asian countries. So, um, and uh, we have another problem is like, um, we have transplant act uh, to uh, like uh, prohibit illegal organ transplant. On the other hand, we have human trafficking act. So something like penalized organ trafficking. Uh, so my background is, uh, I was judge in Bangladesh, so magistrate. So I found like it's difficult to, understand the difference between organ removal and also organ trafficking. And um, recently I did uh, field work, basically the victim was all of them are criminals. Why? Because they sold their organ. But where this um, sold the organ, basically their consent was compromised and that is vulnerability to, tra to trafficking. That's my understanding because they are not, um, yes, they're selling because they want money. But why that is one of the ground of, or I can say one of the causes of human trafficking. So it's still, you know, like confusion when the uh, legal institutions are confused about the law and how they will implement that. And uh, international, I think uh, that is also the international responsibility to look at um, that we should have some hard law, not the soft instrument like uh, who guiding principle. That is not enough like um, to make accountable the recipient countries and also to figure out the state responsibility of the source countries. So yeah, that is like, yeah, I found this. And um, it's really, uh, I'm really glad to be here because I heard something like I'm doing research. So you are doing great job. Thank you. Thanks so much. Maria, were you, were you keen to say something to that as you're nodding along or, or anybody else? No, I agree. I am agree. grateful that uh, the participant, uh, sorry, I, I not I didn't catch your name, um, but I agree with everything you've said. And I think making these distinctions, being clear, and that's not really easy to do. We need to acknowledge that. What is, how do we, can we draw a watertight line between organ trafficking and trafficking for organ uh, uh, harvesting um, uh, but it's important because there it's hard to go down it's difficult to go down on companies and medical profession hard if we haven't clarified these things um, so yeah that's I don't have much else 
to say, and I do believe that voluntary guidance, they're very good. We can use them for advocacy. We can keep talking about that, can knocking on doors. But, you know, if we look at, for instance, regulation around corruption, corporations take that extremely seriously in their transnational operation. Corruption, it raises red flags in every multinational or anything. They have procedures. They know what to need to, to look, which red flags to look for and what is prohibited. So I cannot understand, and this is now beyond or organ transplantation, why uh, uh, similar standards cannot be uh, adopted for other, for the host of human rights in which companies can be uh, implicated. So I am not a big fan of uh, voluntary and soft law uh, because companies can choose to ignore them when it suits them. I'm happy to respond to it, Spelly. Oh, please do, please um, do, Natalia. Thank you. Or Wayne would like to. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, speaking as a lawyer, I always say law is only as good as its implementation. Um, and we do have a problem in generally at international level, international law with enforcement of the law. So if we were to rely just simply on the uh, letter of law, we probably wouldn't go far. But law is important because it, um, it clarifies um, obligations uh, and it clarifies what needs to be done and uh, what is what, what should be done um, whether that you and, and often how we judge effectiveness of the law is is, is not uh, not exclusively but whether um, you know how many prosecutions we have but whether actually there is a change within within a society um, or, or in this in, in this case um, amongst the um, uh, corporations and how they behave and I think that even though UN guiding principles are obviously not legally binding there have over the years I, I think there's enough evidence to say that they have had an impact in the sense that many companies have um, changed the ways they do it and as Wayne mentioned in the advisory one of those suggestions is to start with the policies um, and obviously having a policy and um, corporate policy on what to do and how to do things it's not in itself um, enough. Those policies need to be implemented, needs to, they need to be followed, but also, obviously unless you have a policy a starting point, uh, it's probably unlikely that um, the businesses will, will act accordingly. Now, in, in, in terms of um, the, the wider conversation, um, it's something, and hence I use the example at the very, very beginning, because if we just simply focus on trafficking persons for the purpose of organ removal, so that is regulated under um, uh, human trafficking legislation, then we are going to miss out on the other aspect of organ trafficking that we covered, which is organ trafficking obviously covers the trafficking of persons for organ removal, but also um, um, tourism, trafficking tourism and 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 um, trafficking of organ species themselves, which is much wider. Um, and, but I highlighted that even when you have specific national legislation at this state um, in relation to New South Wales, the Tissue Act, which prohibits trading in tissue, um, then that in itself becomes a little more problematic when we start applying to transnationally or to, or to uh, operations, business operations that happen across different countries. Um, so the, the, the um, extraterritorial jurisdiction or the application of the domestic law has its limitations as well. So I definitely agree with what's been said so far that we um, do need to utilize what we already have and look into what else could be put in place. And just very uh, briefly, um, since 2014, the, at the UN level, there have been negotiations around UN uh, convention on businesses, uh, which would be legally binding. Uh, but again, at the international level, as it happens, um, those conventions, those hard laws, uh, they take time. Uh, there's a question whether that's ever going to materialize. Um, and if it is going to materialize, what actually, what is the final product, if, if you like, what is the actual uh, final um, um, legal act that we're going to see there? And is it, is it going to be um, 
significantly water down that it, that it is possible before go i'm, I'm going to go back to my initial point saying that yes law is important uh, and also clarity of the law is critical especially when we to, to talking about criminalizing uh certain um certain uh, activities but at the same time i think we need to think in parallel as to how change behavior uh, in, of the industry, of those within the industry and the general public, because something that Richard also pointed out, people often, uh, those individuals recipients do not know when they purchase um, uh, organ in this context and where, where it comes from, or they simply don't care. Um, and therefore, raising awareness, education of the general public of, about also the risks of doing uh, transplants abroad. Uh, and obviously we're talking about highly um, desperate people. This is not something, we're not talking about buying a new pair of shoes, I'm gonna go abroad. This is, the desperation uh, pushes people to go abroad to have transplantations, but there are high risk, health risks in relation to those transplantations um, for various reasons, because the way they've been performed or maybe because they're not uh, gonna receive full documentation as to where the organ comes from, et cetera, et cetera. And so when they return, uh, to their um, home country, then they might not be follow up to the same extent with with a doc doctor um, uh, uh, um, so doctoral help and, and support. So there are a lot of issues that arise around those issues, and and so none of those um, necessarily are the fix or. But at the same time, I think we need to look into it collectively and what can and should be done in terms of regulating the industry uh, and also uh, raising our understanding of the dangers, obviously not only to the donors, uh, but also to the recipients. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, we are overrunning. Does anybody else have any, have any other comments? Or if anyone needs to dash off, feel free. Um, We, we can stay on afterwards, if, um, some, some of GRC and Nina and I can stay on after if anyone's got any other questions as well. Otherwise we can wrap up. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, really, really, really grateful to have you. That was an excellent debate. Um, thank you for your work in exposing these crimes um, as well as making meaningful steps for, for change. Um, thank you and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you all. You and too. you. Thank and you. you. Bye bye.